Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for part two. Uh, we are continuing where we left off last week. I'm going to ask you a question, Joseph, based on what Suzanne said, and this brings it to, um, you know, managing our mental health as a daily, not just if someone is experiencing uh, mental illness. So what roles do you find, uh, Joseph, that Indigenous remedies play in aiding um, and managing our, our mental health on a daily basis? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I one of the things that I saw that happens immediately is now out of all of the programs that we offer as a business, like on metabolism, on women's health, on, uh, on addictions, on, on uh, arthritis, and every, out of everything that we do, absolutely every, I'll give everyone like a big laundry list, March, only mental health. <laughs> Now everyone only wants uh, uh, to look at or to understand more about uh, uh, medicines, plant medicines role in managing, helping to manage mental health. And um, there's a few, uh, there's a few key ones. So, so we, we created and, and have been delivering this program for about four years now. So I don't know, like all over the place. It's, it's been crazy. Uh, but um, over the last four years, we've been able to sort of hone in on the most uh, impactful because we offer experiences. We give people the medicine uh, and, and uh, we don't uh, like, we try not to just teach about it and walk away. <laughs> we give people the medicine there that day. And I, and I ask for a cross section of, uh, of, of, um, people who consider themselves mentally healthy to uh, in, in really bad places at all different ages, at all different work, work, who works at all different capacities, bring them all a cross section of everybody and we'll all record uh, our impact or what this medicine is doing to me. And, uh, and so it's what we do. Uh, it ends up being pretty rigorous. Uh, of course, not with the rigor of like, a study or something like this, but there, there's rigor behind it, uh, whether the participants know it or not. And um, over the past four years, yeah, we've been able to hone in on what is the most impactful. And um, uh, one of the, um, so there's two things that I want to say. Number one is, uh, is the most impactful medicine that we could provide for somebody regarding their mental health. Uh, it's, it's actually really funny because it's, it's not considered a mental health medicine. It's a medicine for your gut. It's for your intestine. It's a plant we call um, it's um, sweet fern, Comptonia peregrina, and we make tea. Uh, and so um, when we're looking at our physical health, we're looking at our body, uh, the largest source of inflammation of chronic low grade levels of inflammation is coming from our gut. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so because like the, the you know, open junctions and things that we call leaky gut and uh, one of the ways that your body can sort of seal that, that in te your intestines uh, from, from um, you know, bacteria and proteins going out into your body, creating this huge inflammatory response, your, um, uh, your your body your intestines can seal this with an amino acid called glutamine uh, or we will call mucin and uh, uh, there th that's what that medicine will work with uh, re-establishing and uh, creating more mucin to seal that barrier in your intestines and remove the largest source of inflammation. And so we just watched that sort of happen organically, it just happen naturally where we were able to see that the biggest, the medicine that seems to have the largest impact on people's mental health long-term is medicine for inflammation. And then to look into literature and identify a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, issues regarding 
uh, anxiety and depression being uh, um, largely uh, um, uncontrolled or unmanageable because of excessive amounts of inflammation. So that just sort of happened as a byproduct on the side. And so we had a lot of fun with that. Uh, the main medicine that we sort of offer, the main, the main plant that we offer is, um, uh, uh, is it's called Rike, Rike leaves is um, uh, sweet, sweet flag, a chorus calamus or a chorus americanus. And I, that one is one of my favorites. So yeah, the other uh, main, the, the, aside from the whole inflammation and gaining control within that, uh, the medicine that works specifically with the, with, with our, you know, with our mental health is going to be uh, this plant that we call Wiccan. It's sweet flag or a chorus calamus americanus. It's grows all over the place. It's really, really common. Generally, we only use the roots, but when we use the leaves, this is what, this is how we help with like, uh, you know, chieftains of mental health. We look at ang anxiety and depression. Uh, and so the way that we explain this, it's my absolute favorite to use in high schools because uh, high schools are rough. It's totally different. I, I was only in high school a couple of years ago. Now it's crazy. I can't even imagine going through that <laughs> uh but so it's my favorite to use there because we notice the the impact is is so uh fast uh and so when i go into a high school we'll make the tea and we'll all we'll all just enjoy this tea. it's really delicious it tastes like lemongrass it's like uh Nishnaba lemongrass. You could even use it in your cooking this way to perfume your rice and then your medicine is within your food, which is the way that it was supposed to be anyway. But anyway, the, uh, we, uh, so when you have, uh, you, you have two parts to your nervous system, right? You have your uh, sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system, and they sort of pendulate between one another. Uh, your sympathetic nervous system is is your stress response is your survival mode it's when something happens and you have to deal with it uh your parasympathetic is relaxing and sleeping calming down lowering your heart rate uh lowering your blood pressure uh and, and so um they go back and forth between each other throughout the day we something happens and we deal with it and we calm down and something else happens and they go back and forth and back and forth uh one of the things that happens uh, uh, when, when we're not a part of a culture or a part of a system that allows us to be able to, uh, to it, it's a learned uh, strategy to be able to learn how to manage that pendulation. And so it's experts like Suzanne and Tanya that, that, will, that are there to teach us how to keep this pendulating properly, to be able to understand how this works. Uh, and, and, but what happens, medicine's role is, is when is, the role that medicine plays in the management of mental health is when we receive a trauma and we go survival mode and we go sympathetic uh, and your parasympathetic cannot, cannot do its job. It can't pull you back all the way. It can't fully relax you. It can't fully lower your heart rate. It can't give you control over your own breath. Uh, and, and, and so what happens is you stay slightly elevated, slightly sympathetic, slightly survival mode, slightly stressed out. Uh, and the longer you stay there, the more opportunity that that will establish itself as chemistry and establish itself as a new normal. And then when that's your new normal, slightly stressed out all the time, uh, it's easier for triggers to happen. And a trigger happens, another trauma happens, and you go sympathetic. And and you know you, you we're not engaging uh uh with uh or not a part of these these systems that teach us how to manage this pendulation so your parasympathetic can't pull you again all the way and then that will turn into a new normal and then this one will turn into a new normal and then this one and so you you create or you establish this this ladder of chemistry or this ladder of new normal until you're just rocking sympathetic all the time and, and and we look at this as anxiety and this as depression and this as uh, uh the longer you stay in that state uh this will it, it this will manifest itself as a in a in a 
physical form that we will call PTSD. And so uh, medicine's role is to, is to bypass this, is to take that chemical ladder and, 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 that, and, and that those physical representations and, and remove it. And so what this medicine does, it's one of the, uh, there's a, uh, what do you call it? Um, there's, a, there's a surgery that you could do that called a stellate ganglion block uh, for PTSD, to help manage PTSD. And when pharmaceutical industry, pharmaceutical company looks into the natural world to identify a plant component that is able to establish the same thing, the, the number one candidate is uh, and has been for like 30 years, Sweet Flag, of course, Calamus Americanus, they've been using our medicine to try to create, uh, well, to try to create a drug. And it has been unsuccessful for the past 30 years. The surgery has been being done since the 20s. What they're able to identify is this medicine creates a bypass mechanism around the stellate ganglion rather than paralyzing it, like what the surgery does. It establishes a bypass mechanism, bypassing all of this chemistry that has been created to then allow that parasympathetic action, to allow you to to suddenly have control over your heart rate, to have control over your breath, to be able to calm down, to be able to relax, to be able to sleep. And so when we spend a couple of days inside of, a, inside of a high school, the very next day, sometimes even by the end of the day, students that have red faces, such high blood pressure, and, and just on edge all the time, but even sometimes by the end of the day, they already notice that there's something different that's happening. And then they go home and they sleep 12 hours and then they come back to school the next day and with this resilience. And that's one of my favorite things to see. I love going to high schools just for that. Uh, and, and observing the, the impact that that medicine can have, but, but really that's like a, yeah, medicine plays an important role, but it's that council, it's that system that is there to give us the supports we need to continue that pendulation that is the, the longevity of mental health uh, adaptation and, uh, uh, and, and resiliency and strength within that system. That's where it is in those supports. And so that's why Susan, Susan, Tanya, they're the ones doing, doing the real work. You know, uh, this medicine is just able to give you the ability to feel what, what it feels like to have, you know, normal function. And, and it's up to the individual to maintain that normal function. Uh, if, I could, if I could add, um, what, Joseph, what Joseph is saying is so profound um, and so important because it, it speaks to two key things that we don't do in our North American society. One is we don't eat foods that promote great mental health or promote, promote great health, right? So, you know, one of the biggest things, you know, I'm not going to name any companies, but the food that's on the rise during, during this time are all the foods that create inflammation in the body, which, it re which wreaks havoc on our, on our system, right? So we are, we are designed to eat processed foods, fast foods, and we're getting further and further away from the earth, which means more challenges for our mental health. The second thing is we are, we are a society that's conditioned to suppress our, our emotions, right? Deal with that later, be strong, you know, don't, don't talk about that, uh, don't seek help. And, and the tougher you are and the more tough exterior you have and the less you deal with your emotions seems to be the more we're rewarded in society. Well, you combine those two together and now you have a situation where when people are left alone, that's what they know. And so, so we, and you see now we have a lot of prop, you know, people talk about I'm an emotional leader. Well, an emotional leader is the answer to pushing down your emotions and eating them, right? I, I'm, I'm blowing up. Well, anger is, yeah, it's normal. Ang anger is a way of, I haven't dealt with the emotion and maybe the emotion is not anger, but it's showing up as an anger. Depression is, is suppressed emotions that's not like we have all these things and so our answer is to is to is to drug it or suppress it which which are neither working 
And so we're in this cycle and then you add something like COVID on top of that and you have people at heightened states of emotions, heightened states of fear, heightened states of anxiety and no coping mechanisms because they're not natural in how we survive. And so what we're really talking is about, you know, like, you know, when, when you did this, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so good. Because when it doesn't come back here, how you get it back here is emotional awareness, right? It's, it's an awareness of your emotions and then implementing coping skills that allow things to come back to that place. But we are not conditioned to be aware of what's going on emotionally and mentally so that we can actually learn to do the work so that we can get back into this place of, 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 of rest, right? Um, we're not even conditioned to get enough sleep, right? But so, we, so our natural society is doing all the things that are contrary to mental health, but yet having mental health. It doesn't work. Beautifully said. I, I love that piece. And what I'm hearing from, from both of you is that um, we've, we've moved away from that mindfulness and really managing our mindset. And because of that disconnect, that we are open to all of these other things that are causing chaos uh, internally and externally for us. So, um, and that was what my next question was going to be, was what's the connection in all of this between mindset and mental health? And I think that you guys have both touched on that um, with what you're saying. Um, Tanya, I know that you, you do a lot of work with people with mindfulness as well. So did you want to add a piece to this? Um, I, uh, I think the way you think about things changes what happens to you in a sense um, that we can focus on things being unfair or um, uncalled for. And oftentimes things are unfair and they are uncalled for. And we often don't get what we deserve. And there are often people who get things that they haven't earned. But we, we can focus there, but that isn't a forward focus, right? That's not a, for, that's not a focus that is going to have our momentum in a forward direction towards our wellness, our goals. Um, and I think uh, when we choose to focus instead on what responsibility can I take in this situation? Responsibility isn't a blame. It's not about saying, I, I made this mess, so I have to clean it up. No, it's about looking at things and going, I'm the most qualified to fix this and fixing it, regardless of who, who actually did the breaking. And I think that um, when we really go through life looking for the things that we can have responsibility over, we're looking for things also that we can have control over, things that take into account, actions that we can take, that take into account our resources, our knowledge, our supports, our abilities in that particular moment in time, because that changes. So those, all of those things are quite variable. And I think that when we are, when we go through life asking the question of, does this advance our health or our wellness, I should say, um, or doesn't it, then we're moving through life in a more mindful way. And we're able to do things like pick our battles. We're able to do things like choose food that nurtures our bodies, fuels our bodies. I always think of our, our nutrition like the fuel in a car, right? Or the different foods in a car. If you try to run a car without oil, you're going to be in for a very big surprise, right? <laughs> so, and, and again, when it comes down to that daily maintenance and daily routines, um, when people call our crisis line and they're having that super resistant crisis where they just can't come down and you say to them, well, what have you eaten today? Nothing. What have you had to drink today that didn't have alcohol or caffeine in it? Well, I've had six coffees. Okay, that's a problem. 
Um, when was the last time you slept? When was the last time you showered? A lot of times people think that, oh, you don't even want to listen to me. That's so insensitive. No, what I want you to do is give your body what it needs to control this crisis right now. And, and oftentimes we neglect the most, um, the easiest things that we can change, right? We can go and have a glass of water. We can go and put minerals, nutrients, proteins, healthy fats in our body. And we can do things to increase the amount of rest we have. I'm like the most notorious insomniac you'll ever meet in your life. I have all of the sleep disorders, all of them right here. Um, so I, I understand how hard that can be and how we have to um, sometimes think of a rest differently and, and expand our definition of that. What do we need to do to rejuvenate ourselves? Does that mean being in nature and, and, and communing with nature? Uh, Fozzie, I think that, was it you said that you like to stand in the grass? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that if we can go through life asking that question, does this enhance my wellness or does it take away from my wellness? And if it takes away from our wellness, why are we doing it? What's the motivation here? And if we're doing it because someone else wants us to or to avoid someone else getting angry with us or to avoid someone else's emotions, we really need to think about that. Very well said. I love how you put the, the responsibility back to uh, ourself. And, and that's really empowering. And I just want to give uh, Suzanne a moment to add to this because I know Suzanne, this is, this is your piece because you are the mindset master mentor. And so um, if, if you want to add something right there, because I know that Tanya is speaking your truth right now. She, she is so speaking my truth and, and Tanya, thank you so much. Uh, so well said. And I, and I think, you know, one of the things when, when I've been looking at what's occurring uh, during these past six months, there are kind of three types of people. And the three types of people will also determine their, their state of mental health. So there's been the group of people that you watch that are watching everything on the news. They're watching everything negative. They're watching all the stuff. And, and they're angry at everything outside of themselves. And, and, and so they're like, when are the politicians going to tell us this? Did you notice politicians didn't do this? Did you know the hospitals didn't do this? Did you know? And what they're, what they're not looking at is they are feeling out of control and they're looking for someone to help them regain a sense of control. But the challenge is, is they're looking outside of themselves. So they're looking outside of themselves. And, and when you do that, all you do is, as Tanya said, is you play the waiting game. You play the waiting game for someone else to make change so you can experience change that's beneficial to you. So we have a lot of society that's doing that and the anxiety and anger is rising. Then you have the other group of people, um, and Tanya, you alluded to this at the beginning as well, is um, I'm just gonna wait for this to be over and I'm, I'm gonna bake. I'm gonna go to create a new habit, I'm a hobby, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And while that is functional in the moment, it's also another way of avoiding um, what's, go what's going on. So there's those that are micro -fo like focus on every detail, and there's those that kind of have their head in the sand and avoiding, but, that, but avoiding doesn't mean the emotions go away. Avoiding isn't coping, avoiding is still avoiding. So, so you're gonna feel that, you know, we, you know we, we're gonna have this, uh, how long can you wait it out? There's going to be the point where the wait is too long because resources may run out, things may happen. So there's a group that's avoiding and that's still not taking responsibility. And then there's the third group who are, are really going, first thing they're doing, they're saying, I need to accept what's happening. And I'm using the word intentionally. I need to accept what's happening. Once they've accepted it, they do exactly what Tanya is saying, is they go, what can I take responsibility for? What do I have the ability to do in order to recreate a sense of feeling in control? Because that's what we're missing for many people. We're missing the sense of feeling in control. Now, the reality is we were never in control at all anyway, right? Things were predictable, but now things aren't predictable. So we're trying to regain a sense of control. Well, what you always have control over is what you choose to believe, how you choose to respond, how you choose to look at things, what you choose to influence you. 
And that's the place where change can happen. So you might say, I'm going to turn off the TV and not look at all this news because it's influencing me negatively. I'm not going to communicate with people who are not giving me things that are empowering because it's influencing me negatively. Then you're able to ask yourself, okay, so I'm managing my influences. How can I respond right now? What are things I can do? What routines can I put in place to help me feel in control of the things that I can't manage? that are no longer predictable? What can I do to at least make my environment a little bit more predictable? Now people are in a place where they're actually, I call it living in the face of their emotions. They're experiencing emotions, making clear choices, but they're also taking back charge. Because as Tanya is saying, the one thing that we have 100% responsibility for is ourselves, but it's also the one thing that we have 100% control over is our choices, not anyone else's. So it's to sit in that place and go, I, I go and how can I, and I go and ask yourself, how can I be the hero in my life versus sitting in a place of victim? How can I be my own hero right now? Oh, I love that. How can I be my own hero in my life? And uh, that, that's a great way to look at it. Um, thank you so much. I just realized we're coming to the top of the hour. This time has gone by so quick. So as we come to a close, um, I, I want to ask each of you if you could leave the viewers with a final word on um, what they can do to support their mental health and, and their self-care. Just a quick final word. Um, who wants to go first? I was I was right, that kid in school that, okay, that, couldn't, yep. that couldn't let uh, a, a question go unanswered in class. So if, if you notice that when you don't designate a question to a certain direction, I'm like, <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> um, I think that one of the things that we have to realize is that this is a hard situation, right? Um, we are not struggling because we are bad copers or we're terrible at wellness. We are, we are struggling because this is hard. And if you guys will indulge me, I'd like to share my marathon analogy. Fozzie has heard this like 7,000 times, um, and I apologize to her, but it's inspired by the um, women's marathon at the Rio Olympics four years ago because one of the female Olympians, she was a medaler, I can't remember which uh, medal, but it doesn't matter, um, took two steps over the finish line, collapsed. Now, did she collapse because she's a bad runner, right? Because that's what our clients say to themselves, that they're struggling, not because things are hard, but because they're bad at coping. No, she took two steps over that finish line and collapsed because, wait for it, Marathons in July in Rio are hard, right? She's an Olympic class athlete and she's gonna run again, probably within a couple of days of, of that finish line. And she is going to continue to do great things. She's an amazing runner. She just finished 42.2 kilometers. She hasn't collapsed because she's a bad runner. It's because it's hard. There are people puking in the bushes. The first aid tent is full because marathons in July are hard. We are all at the finish line. Well, actually, we're probably not at the finish line. We are at a water station <laughs> in a marathon going, how do we keep going? But we can keep going because we've been going. We've made it this far. And I think, you know, it's so important to recognize that we do have coping skills. We do have coping strategies and that it's okay to reach out to supplement that with help. And that we sometimes do have to look at um, or consider the fact that our, 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 the supports within our friends and family circles may not be qualified to provide us with the support we need and to reach out to more professional types of support or, or different kinds of support. Um, and, and recognize that that's okay. That doesn't mean we failed. We are marathon runners in July. <laughs> Puking is not a sign that we're bad at it. It's a sign that it's hard, and that's okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Suzanne, final word. 
for our viewers? Um, I think what I would say is, um, is that look for the blessing. And, and why I say that is, is that there's a saying that what you focus on, you find. So if you focus on how hard this is, and we'll have moments where we'll experience hardship, um, you're going to find that this is hard the whole time. If you focus on how unfair it is, you're going to find that it is unfair. But if you choose to focus on what's the blessing in this, what's the learn, what's the opportunity for me to grow, what's the opportunity for me to transform? Like jo Joseph said, it was the opportunity for his business to get online and he's probably touching way more lives than he, than he had when he was traveling, right? What's the blessing? And, and, and when you start looking for the blessing, remember what you focus on, you always find. Well, the blessing will give you opportunities to become more. It'll be give you opportunities to grow. It'll be give you opportunities to maybe say, you know what? It, we needed more family time. I needed to slow down. I needed to sleep more. I need to be still. I needed time alone. What is the blessing? And once you find it, nurture it, water it, allow it to grow, and then look for another blessing. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And so true. Find the blessing. That's a great, uh, that's a great share and great message for everyone. Uh, Joseph, final word to the viewers. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the things I keep thinking about every time these guys are talking, um, I keep thinking of one, uh, one time I was out getting medicine and uh, I, I, we were getting arthritis medicine. So I was with one of, one of the teachers I learned from. And uh, he said, he, uh, he, he said, I'll go to say pick medicine. And so I went that way. And then we came back and all of his trees were real awful looking. <laughs> I had all mine look real beautiful. They look all perfect and his looked awful. And I thought, well, how come you're getting all those real horrible looking trees? And uh, and he said, well, this, these are the ones. These are these are the ones that you have to get. These are the these are the ones that they're they're stronger medicine. And uh, and then that just bugs me, bugged me real bad. And uh, so I just, you know, uh, he, you know, he's my teacher. I want to understand everything that he's saying. And so I take it as an opportunity to learn. What is he talking about? And uh, wh every time we go out and pick medicine, he's always finding all of these plants that are struggling, like they're just, just hanging on. And 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 so, uh, one of the things that I was able to learn from that is that uh, the more stress that a plant has had to overcome, the stronger it is. When a fungus tries to attack a plant, the plant has to activate, it, activate its immune system and kill that fungus with what we call medicine. So the more fungus that's attacking it, the more response that that plant has to have. And so when you go pick medicine, you always find the plants that have overcome the most amounts of stress, the most, the most moose lips coming and, and eating all the branches, the most rabbits nibbling on it, the more mites boring into it, the more uh, fungus attacking it. You all, those are all signs that this plant, this is gonna be stronger medicine. And for some of them, they can be almost uh, 60 times stronger if you find a plant that has been through it versus a beautiful little plant that never dealt with anything its whole life. So it can be almost 60 times more active. And so it's the same thing like with us. When we exercise, when we go to the gym, no one goes to the gym now. Well, actually, maybe you guys, some of you do. But uh, um, when you go to the gym and you're lifting a dumbbell, you're stressing out that bicep. And uh, the more stress you apply to that muscle, the bigger and stronger that it's going to be. Uh, and the same thing, you go for a run. You're stressing out your cardiovascular system. The more runs you go on, uh, the, the, the faster and farther you're going to be able to run. You're going to be adapting to that stress. And so um, 
Uh, so we look for it in medicine, but it's, you know, pretty analogous to the, the things that we have to deal with and understanding that mental health is an important aspect uh, uh, as to who we are as people. And it needs to be fostered and nurtured in the same way as our physical health, as our spiritual health, as our emotional health. All of these things have to be working together. They're all parts of our being. Uh, it, the more stress that, well, Stress is always an opportunity for growth. Stress is always a signal for growth, an opportunity for change. And the more of those that we have, the, the, to, uh, the, the more opportunity we have to, to get stronger. And so uh, identifying that perspective and, uh, is, is really nice. And so that's been a lot of the things that my... Uh, some of the participants in our programming have been able to see when they go out, they're able to just identify and relate so much more with the medicine that they're picking because maybe they've been through it all too. And then to have that little shift inside of them. Uh, it's so, so when we go out and get medicine like this, we get outside, uh, we have those experiences of those relationships. It's really fun to be able to see. Uh, and so, yeah, these these guys, they're they're the ones that uh, know how to get to 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 overcome those stresses. They're the masters in giving us the tools that we need to to get this system stronger. To to so to see this as an opportunity for growth, uh, uh, an opportunity for change. Uh, and then to be exposed to experts like Suzanne and Tanya to be able to uh, give you the tools you need to be able to work that out, work that system out and get it stronger. So it's really neat to be able to be here with, uh, with these gals. Well, thank, thank you so much for that, Joseph. And I, I just love the final thoughts that you guys are leaving our viewers with. Um, and so true that uh, we will come out of this stronger. So again, this has been such a great discussion. I want to thank each of you for taking time to speak with us today. And for our viewers that are interested in getting in touch with any of our panelists, you can do so by contacting us here at New Horizon Media Arts. Thank you again, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.